From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 115, recorded on August 24th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me today are Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello. How Everyone. Are, how, <laughs> how are both of you? How are both of you gentlemen doing on this lovely who wants to Summer go first? Day. I'm I'm tired. I'm you're, tired. You're exhausted. I had a, I had a very eventful last night trying to um, put my child on Amtrak, and then realizing with ten minutes to go that this would fall under unaccompanied minor and the paperwork, oh, and no. so I I got to enjoy a train ride to Providence, two and a half hour wait, a long slow train ride back to New York, oh, very limited Lord, sleep, Lord. and and here I am. And what, what uh, were you doing in Providence? Uh, so my um, daughter, and actually a friend of, a um, childhood friend of my wife's, Albert, is a 14-year-old from uh, Barcelona. The two of them were being met in Providence by my wife. They're going to spend some time with her parents on Cape Cod. Nice. Chilling. Very nice. Yeah. What part of Cape Cod? Falmouth. Not far from no Whitehall. exactly. East no Falmouth. No beautiful, exactly. beautiful place. Yeah, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous area. Foul, if you're having a foul mouth, you're yeah, well, foul, yeah. foul mouth. Foul mouths are found uh, <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> now, Out on the street. Uh, um, the, the Woods Hole thingy, where is that with respect to Falmouth? It's just a little bit north. Because the Cape which curves is, south, So Falmouth right? is a little north, so Woods Hole is a little south of Falmouth. Think of it as you're, you, you know, you're in Boston, and you're going to go south, and you're going to go yeah, across right. a little it, narrow it bit of land. Yeah, yeah. Right. And if you can just keep continuing, now you're on Cape Cod. If you continue to the southwest corner, that's going to be right. Woods Hole there. Right. But now Cape Cod is going to extend like a big mm. foot right. and then curve up. I guess like it would be a, what, a hobbit or some kind of foot where it yeah. curls at the end or something. <laughs> a jester's. <laughs> a jester's shoe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. And, then, and so the, the, it curves up like that. And you've got the bay, which is That's right. inside this this curve, sort of you'd say on top of your foot. Provincetown is at the tip. And just below the foot, that's where you've got Martha's Vineyard. And a little bit farther east, you've got Nantucket. Yeah, it's, Martha's uh, Vineyard. So all the way at the tip is Provincetown, right? Exactly. Yes. Yep. All the way at the northeast right. tip. And at the southwest tip of Cape Cod is where Woods Hole and Falmouth, which is yeah. which is great because then you put um, Falmouth right on Barnegat Bay, this protected area. So it's warm. It's great for swimming. If you mm -hmm. go around to the Atlantic, so the southern side, that's like the Vineyard Sound exposed. It's a lot colder, windier. Hmm. Yep. Um, well, I, I brought our kids to see a, a college up there, uh, Roger something. Anyway, it's near. Is that it? Maybe. Anyway, it's right near, New, right near Newport. Oh, okay. Well, there's um, University of Rhode Island, which is right outside no, before that. you cross the bridge. Is there's Roger something. Roger Williams. It's got to be Williams. And anyway, Newport. Well, Williams itself is Massachusetts. Right? Yeah, it's Williams. West Williams. Williams. So, Roger Williams is. But Roger different. Williams. But okay. It's, right. it's near Newport, which is a big sailing place, right? I, I love yeah. Newport. We went to visit there, <clears throat> and the Breakers is the old, the, the castle of who? Who was that? The. Uh, Vanderbilt or the old robber barons, the old the breaker I, castles, had something there, <laughs> and it's right on the water, yeah. and it's just, it's what just do they spectacular. call their little homes? <clears throat> the wow. carriage houses, the little carriage. They houses. call them little cottages. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> fifty million dollar cottages. But right across from the breakers, it's a Vanderbilt mansion. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, is a small private college. Yeah. Regine Sal Salva Regine. No. What is it again? And, uh, you're on the right track. Regina something. Salve Regina. There it is. S A L V E Regina. Ah. Salve Regina. So we once had a Gordon conference in Newport. 
And that was interesting. Was it at Salve Regina? I often think they have, <laughs> they have Gordon conferences there. I believe it was. Yeah. All right. And it was fantastic. I mean, you know, just to go into the center of town, and it was great. Here in New York, it's a beautiful summer day. It is. Wouldn't you say the humidity has dropped a bit? It has. It was even nicer yesterday. But I do like the humidity. You like the humidity? I do. Oh, wow. Did you, did you have good sailing this weekend? Um, Actually, spectacular. It's very windy, sailing. yeah. Oh, we... Um, uh, maybe I'll get in trouble if I put this on the uh, on the air, so to speak. But uh, first, right, where were you supposed first, to be? First in no, first in the morning. Um, I went out in the eighteen foot boat for a little while, and then in the evening, uh, my friend Seth Serker has a forty eight foot beautiful sailboat, and we sailed over to Laguardia, and we're as south as you're hmm. allowed to be. But we are right in line with the landing runway. That's cool, isn't it? And so we're Thanks, on the no, sailboat, no, no. and um, and the they're the, pretty low the, over the, you, right? Air, I mean, you know, it's Very this illusion low. that they're going to hit your mat. They're, there's, <laughs> they're just so large that uh, the yeah, perspective they seem so close. And then we, you know, and the airplanes were flying over, and oh, spectacular sail, so great winds. Sunday, uh, my son and I went to the place where we moor our sailboat, and it was too windy. It was mm-hmm. just the two of us, and I don't feel confident that I can properly help him uh in such wind and yeah. you know if we go over um i, I just uh yeah. don't feel it's a good situation yeah. but so we didn't sail he was very disappointed but there are big boats there and i wonder mm-hmm. a 48 foot boat could that be blown over in the wind not very easily right i would say not very not very easily and and they they pop back up got big heavy <laughs> oh, keel. Up. the keel is the <laughs> thing yeah yeah so speaking of that runway and that aquatic environment i had the pleasure once of going out with a fishing guide for striped bass, mm. and we were close enough to the runway where you could wave to the pilot. Because <laughs> <laughs> they sat on the runway yeah. waiting to take off. Oh, waiting, I, you know, not taking. Wave to the pilot. Did you see a double bird hit? No, I didn't see that. You know what that is? Yeah. That's bad We could that have happens. seen that here in our, at our window. Yeah, I was driving down the West Side Highway when and he landed happened, the really? airplane. Yeah, but I didn't get to see it. I was in Switzerland. But the guy's name was Scully. They have a movie now. That's right. Now, that's right. Tom Hanks is playing Scully. Yeah. That's Scully right. or Sully? Sully. Sorry, Sully, 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 Sully. Sully. My wife's name is Cully. And I made a hybrid. <laughs> right. Okay. We have to solve last week's. Okay. The case. puzzler. This yes. Is the... Yes. You know, and I left my notes. So uh, while one of you guys are reading oh, the email, I'll run and get my notes so I remember what the case was. Okay. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, here, you can use mine. <laughs> no. So, so let me remind everyone our case from last time. This was the a unfortunate twelve year old boy who was brought into the hospital ER by his parents with severe headache, stiff neck, fever, decreased alertness. Um, made a note that he had no rashes. Uh, he'd been healthy with no prior medical problems. No one else was ill. Uh, it was during the warm time of year, and the boy had been engaged in usual summertime activities, including um, soccer or what the rest of the world calls football. Uh, he'd been swimming in warm fresh water playing outside um when he came in the initial presentation they were they were thinking of a meningitis and he underwent a lumbar puncture so they put a needle in to get um, a sample of the cerebral spinal fluid and he was started on treatment for meningitis uh, no prior surgeries no allergies not any medications Lived with his mom dad few brothers um, no substance abuse um and I, I mentioned this is not a geographically limited illness so we'll discuss um, where this particular case occurred, um, though I have unfortunately um, sort of run across um, several cases in different areas where this has been the culprit. Uh, he does have a history of lots of bug bites, um, lots of mosquito bites. Uh, this actually was, this young lad was um, from a malaria endemic part of the world. Uh, dogs around as well. Um, symptoms began a day or two before he came to the hospital. Uh, from as far as a dietary history, it's whatever the family eats. Um, all the food's cooked. Uh, he came in febrile. His um, blood pressure was low. His heart rate was up. He was breathing rapidly. Um, decreased responsiveness. Stiff neck. He looked ill. The white blood cell count was elevated. We saw what we've previously discussed as a left shift, meaning neutrophils were increased. We saw no eosinophils. So what we've come to uh, popularize <laughs> as eosinopenic. He was eosinopenic. There was clearing of the eosinophils. Uh, the CSF fluid was noted to have a low glucose. The number of cells was increased. There was no bacteria, fungi, or acid-fast bacilli seen on staining. 
And a, a CAT scan of the head showed diffuse swelling of the brain. And um, unfortunately, as I alluded to, this boy did poorly and it was not a good outcome to the case. The um, first guess came from Carol. Yes. Who said. Yes. <laughs> My diagnosis, Negleria falleri, brain-eating amoeba. Yep. Short but sweet, Dixon. Very. <clears throat> Without any other guesses. <clears throat> She was pretty confident. I think everyone got this one. I do too. <laughs> well, they guessed it. I don't know what the outcome is. We'll yeah, find right, out. Right, exactly. Dr. Wink, I am guessing that the tragic case of the 12-year-old boy with meningoencephalitis in summer was primary amoebic encephalitis. If I'm right, I will be shattering my previous one-in-a-row record. I hope to keep this streak going. I favor Negleria over acanthamoeba, but I'm not sure why. P.S. I like the commercials, and I am enjoying my curiosity stream, <laughs> oh, nice. which I would not have known about without you, cool. Wink Weinberg in Atlanta. Look at that. Dixon. <clears throat> okay, Patricia writes, amoeba infection acquired from swimming in warm water. That's three. Shane writes, I'll do the next one because that was pretty short. Good day, Twip Trio. My guess for Daniel's case from Twip 114 is primary amoebic meningoencephalitis caused by infection by the brain-eating amoeba Negleria falleri. The young boy must likely, most likely, contracted the parasite while diving into warm water. The water, when forced up the nose, can bypass the cribriform plate and deposit the trophozoite stage of the parasite where it can begin feasting on brain tissue. With a fatality rate of over 97%, it does not look good for this patient. Hmm. Kind regards, Shane from Australia. You could sort of tell that from the good day, right? You can. That's true. So they wouldn't say Australia. They would say Strine. What's that? Excuse <laughs> me? their word for Australia. <laughs> Strine. 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 I never heard that it's one. It's Strine. <laughs> it was a whole book with that title. And you wonder, Strine. What the a book about it? It was all about How do you spell it? S-T-R-I-N-E? Yeah, it was something like that. All right, Daniel, that's... can you take the next one? Yosef writes... Um, Dear Twip Trio, I was so excited to hear my professor, Dr. Wiley, finally write into <laughs> Twip. I've been talking to her about this podcast for some time, and it always been encouraging her to write in. I also recommended it to the new second-year students at Hofstra School of Medicine as a fun way to study parasites. I just want to thank you all for everything that you do. P.S. Dr. Griffin asked, my last name is Davidoff. Now, on to a much more sober note. When I first was listening to your case, I immediately jumped to a previous case, TWIP 97, that was presented when I first started listening to this podcast. The case was about two different children from Peru with a change in mental status and findings on brain MRI. As a result, I immediately jumped to the worst conclusion for the child in this case. I would think the likely diagnosis is Negleria falleri. This nasty parasite can cause a meningoencephalitis that will lead to death within a few days with a 99% mortality rate. The findings on CSF examination would be similar to a bacterial infection, low glucose, high white blood cells, but with no bacterial infection to be cultured anywhere. The infection most likely started when the child was swimming in warm, fresh water and accidentally swallowed or aspirated some of the water. The amoeba could make its way through the nasal mucosa, through the cribriform plate and to the brain. Exposure is actually quite common with an estimate that roughly two times out of every million cases in encephalitis. Treatment is with amphotericin B, but that still only increases survival to at most 5%. The other diagnoses are other amoeba such as Balamuthia mandrillaris, acanthamoebia, and Sapinia pedata, but these are much less likely as they would have a more chronic course. There have been only seven surviving cases of nucleariasis in the world. I would prefer if I was wrong about my diagnosis. If not, I offer my condolences to the family. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff. So what were the two children from Peru, Daniel? What did they have? Do you remember that was the Balamuthia mandrillaris oh, right. um, cases? And the story there, we'll, we'll maybe get into this more, but the, the Balamuthia mandrillaris is a soil-dwelling um, right. amoeba. Right. And it had probably gotten through a, a break in the skin and then um, caused this. Initially, there was a localized skin disease, and then it had gone on and involved the brain. Okay. 
Steve writes, hello, it's been a while since I've written in for one of the case studies, primarily because I've really wanted to do full differentials on the cases, and I find myself derailed in my attempts to do so for one reason or another. <laughs> yeah, life gets in the way. <laughs> it does. Our 12-year-old clearly has primary amoebic meningoencephalitis brought on by an infection by Nagleria phalari. If I recall correctly from what I read after our hospital received a patient with this infection last year... <laughs> Only two patients in the U.S. have survived in the last 30 years. Naglaria is an incidental pathogen to humans. Normally, it minds its own business, hanging out in warm water and soil where it consumes bacteria. But occasionally, we humans disturb the soil at the bottom of a nice warm pool. And the trophozoites, if the water gets into the nose attached to the olfactory epithelia, travel up the olfactory nerve into the brain. From there, it causes meningoencephalitis and death follows in most cases. Amphotericin B is the drug of choice, but even then, fatality is greater than 95%. Of note, the two survivors in the U.S. were treated experimentally with the drug miltefacine in addition to the standard treatments. Microscopic examination of CSF can reveal flagellated amoeba, but confirmation requires antigen or PCR testing for neglaria, something most hospital labs probably cannot do. We had to send CSF to the CDC for confirmation far too late to do our patient any good, sadly, though our ED physician cor correctly diagnosed our patient and proceeded accordingly. Bacterial, viral, and fungal infections of the CNS would be included in my differential, though no bacteria or fungi were seen on smears. This isn't likely to be GAE brought on by Balamuthia or Acanthamoeba because of the predominant neutrophils in eosinopenia. This is instead consistent with PAM and bacterial meningitis, with the gram-negative st gram stain being the primary distinction between the two, unless, of course, the lab was, as Daniel seemed to intimate, able to see trophozoites in the CSF. Well, there you have it. I'm sorry for the family's loss. Thanks for another great episode of TWIP. I look forward to seeing if I got this one right. Thanks, Steve. P.S. It's been consistently hot all summer long in the eastern Sierra. August has cooled a bit at night, but I cannot wait for autumn to arrive. <laughs> hmm. Yep. Wait, what's the PAM? Primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. You got it. Uh, GAE. <laughs> Wait a minute. Give me a minute. GAE. <laughs> uh, well, I don't get what's GAE. Granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. Got it. Huh. And ED is, of course, emergency department. Our ED physician, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I find it hard, all these uh, acronyms, because I bounce through sort of different arenas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> they're different. <laughs> they all have their, th and some of them are the same three letter acronyms, whether I'm in the retro virology right. world. That's right. Or the it is hard. We stay in one discipline, right, <laughs> Dixon? Do. Elise Elise writes Dear Twip Trifecta, how are you? It is much more temperate here in lower Manhattan than it has been lately, a week ago. I had a huge pile of New York City air quality alerts on my phone, <clears throat> and the heat made going outside truly dreadful. I am writing quickly because I'm about to travel. So I have not had time to go through, for me, differential diagnosis. I believe, sadly, that the 12-year-old patient in TWIP 114 became infected with Neglaria fowleri, a fowler amoebae. <laughs> it's actually fowleri. This is tremendously unfortunate because there is such a poor survival rate for patients. The real tip-off, apart from the fact that I had literally been talking about this amoeba three days ago, so it and the symptoms it triggers were fresh in my mind, came from Dr. Griffin's emphasis on mentioning that the boy had spent a lot of time swimming in warm, fresh water. The Neglaria fowler I amoeba live in untreated fresh water and replicates rather uh, very quickly when the water temperature goes up. It infects the brain when the water goes up a person's nose, which is why people who swim and dive and play in fresh water are susceptible, as are people who use neti pots for nasal irrigation with untreated water. Because water temperatures have been going up, thanks for climate change, uh, the range for Neglaria phalari amoebae have been increasing, which may account for Dr. Griffin feeling that it wasn't crucial to specify the location of the patient and his family. These infections are easily mistaken for meningitis because the symptoms are so similar, severe headaches, stiff neck, high fevers, lack of responsiveness, and the doctors may have been confused at the boy's lack of responsiveness to the meningitis treatment. It is apparently tricky to always find the amoeba in the spinal fluid, but that is the best way to make a definitive diagnosis. The tragic part of this diagnosis is that the prognosis for patients infected with Neglaria phalari is almost always fatal. There is some success 
if the infection is caught early with an experimental drug, miltifacine, combined with therapeutic hypothermia to bring down hypothermia to bring down the brain swelling. I truly hope that I am wrong in the diagnosis because I fear f- for the worst for this poor child and his family. Thanks. Thank you so much, as always, for your wonderful work. Best wishes. Ed writes, Dear Parasitic Cognoscenti, (laughs) when I was a student focusing on a career in information technology, I discovered that I needed some units in lab science. It appeared to me that a course in microbiology and human welfare would be a slam dunk. (laughs) Dr. Akiyama soon provided me with a reality check. His tests were designed to deliver severe penalties for guessing. (laughs) Oh, dear. Now that I'm retired from decades of software development, primarily in the area of inkjet graphics, I have discovered your delightful podcast and wish to thank you all for renewing my interest in these areas of science. I recently acquired a copy of the fourth edition of Parasitic Diseases, and it is a super reference source. This is a tragic case and certainly must be Neglaria phalari, the brain-eating amoeba, acquired by by ingesting fluid in the nose while swimming in lakes or streams and ultimately penetrating the brain. The unfortunate victim develops amoebic encephalitis, and unless diagnosis is rapid, probably has little chance of survival. Since 1962 to 2015, there have been 138 cases with three survivors, according to a recent CNN article about a patient currently under treatment in Florida. The drug miltefazine has saved two victims in 2013. It is particularly entertaining to listen to Dr. De Pommier share his fly fishing stories, since I do enjoy fly fishing in the eastern Sierra Nevada, near Mammoth Mountain, the San Joaquin River near Devil's Post Pile, and Hot Creek are two of my favorite spots. The current temperature here in Escondido, California is 86 Fahrenheit or 30C with 53% humidity. The jury is still out regarding the effects of El Nino. With little evidence of substantial rain, although water restrictions are being relaxed somewhat. I love the case format of TWIP, so congratulations on a wonderful podcast, Et. Dixon, do you know these uh, Devil's devil's Post Pile? Yeah, I've I've actually done an interesting tour of Yosemite, and it isn't too far away, for uh, the High Sierras uh, trek. We uh, did that about eight years ago. And there are a lot of good fishing opportunities there too, Ed. So I recommend it if you can get involved. It's a by lottery only uh, selection for the hikers, but it's well worth it. Did you fish yesterday? I did. Was it good? It was. Well, it depends on how you define good. Did I mean, you, I caught, did you bring in a fish? I not. I brought in four fish. Okay, then it's but good. The fish, the fish of yesterday, so to speak. There's always one that you can feel particularly good about. Was I stood in one place for about, I would say, 45 minutes. In water that was forty nine degrees mm-hmm. Fahrenheit, cold. It was very cold. My you knee, get my waders on. Yeah, I got waders and everything else on. But they recommend long underwear for this river. It's the west branch of the Delaware. And I observed a fish, maybe rose twice during that time, mm-hmm. two times. But there were flies all over the water. So what is that fish feeding on? Because it's it's active, but it's not rising. So I reached into my fly box and I picked out the right fly and I caught that fish. And so that was a good. What was he interested in? Good moment. Well, they were they were rising for what they call emergers. I see. Which is the nymphal stage as it comes off the bottom as it's supposed to hatch on the surface of the water. The river is so cold that these nymphs are so slow mm-hmm. that those fish are so lucky. <laughs> you know, so uh, caught them on a nymph. Didn't catch so them. On basically, dry. what what I'm understanding is that you like the challenge of tricking. I do. The fish with something fake. You know what? It, it's <laughs> the, the name of the game, and I'm sure Ed knows this too, is okay, what's for dinner? And you have to guess. And if yeah. you do know what's for dinner, then you have to imitate the dinner. So if you tried different things and none of them worked, then it wouldn't be a good day. Then I didn't guess. But you, just being outside and getting fresh air. Oh, no, no, it's fantastic. It's, okay. it's all good. It's all good. But sometimes it's better. You don't fish good. at all, Daniel, right? No, actually, I've been at He's the fly it. fisher. I've He's actually gone it. with Dixon. And, You're uh, kidding. Yeah, but yeah, 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 but yeah. I am a big fan of the outdoors, and so yeah. I enjoy the outdoors so much. Sometimes I feel like a beautiful day outdoors, fly fishing is disturbed by catching a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he had a practice in Colorado for a while. You can't get better than that. can't get better than Colorado. That's, especially if you have patients that I, live on private water. 
and you treat them, and they say, oh, Doc, how can I thank you enough? And you can say, well, let me think now. Let me, hmm. <laughs> can I move to Colorado? You have to tap your chest. You know, you know for, for fly fishing, I hate to diss Colorado, but I'm going to have to say Idaho and Montana. Really? Yeah. I used to love to get up to Henry's Fork uh, oh, for the opening. Great, oh, and the fishing in uh, southwestern Montana. Yes, uh, I, I loved it up there. And you were at Hamilton. Remember when yeah, you it's took good there. Yeah. Hamilton. Hamilton. The, the that, Bitterroot the bitter goes right root. down bitter through root, the yeah, middle of town. Yeah. My it's, first job was actually as a doctor in Helena, Montana. No. Yeah, so I started out there. But wow. oh, I, the fishing out there, that's, that's it's wonderful. It's hard to beat. Unfortunately, they've had a, a fish kill just about a week ago on the Yellowstone River from Livingston all the way down to the part where it turns into a warm water river. And you'll never guess which fish has been most affected. The white fish, not the trout, the white fish. Mm -hmm. And they think, they think it might be a viral infection, Vincent, so we might be able to do something about that on TWIV. Um, interestingly enough, the trout are not dying. Gee, Only the white fish. Most specificity. Very wow. much so. <laughs> the problem is that with that situation, if the white fish all die, yes. then the trout fishing is going to be lousy for Why a long that? time Why because the trout eat the baby white fish. Oh, they're carnivorous. They are. They're all carnivorous. The trouts are all carnivorous. They're no herbivore trout. Thank God for that. At least it would be hard to imitate a piece of algae. <laughs> Put it on the end of your hook. Yeah. Well. All right. Have a few more. Paul writes twiplets. Sunny twiplets. Uh, we've never been called twiplets. Yeah, yeah. We've had that one. Yeah. I don't remember. A lovely twenty-eight C and sunny here in Indianapolis. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Yes. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> You mentioned warm water swimming several times. You also mentioned not a lot of other cases seen. Eosinopenia, not sure what that means. Neutrophils and macrophages would be your primary line of defense, if I guess correctly. Lots of neutrophils in CBC. What's CBC? Complete blood count. Got it. Right. Could this be the rare 138 cases reported since 62, but dreaded Negleria phalari, contracted intranasally by swimming in warm water lake? If this was a New York or New Jersey case, the CDC has to update their map. <laughs> a good right. point. Only reference for treatment I saw was IV and intracisternal intrathecal amphotericin B treatment. Also added on some dexamethasone for brain swelling. Assume you would have to catch this early before too much brain damage occurs. A bit of nightmare fuel for all of us listeners who thought we would be safe swimming in a lake. Mm. A tragic rare infection and outcome for your young patient. I have heard the organism has been found further and further north in U.S. lakes, and he provides a reference, Paul. With then, evidence then, of climate change. Then, then he sent another follow-up. I sent in a guess that your case study might be Negleria, if that was a correct guess, I just read a story about a child from Florida that survived after being treated with miltefacine from Profunda Pharmaceutical, dropped temperature to 33 degrees, induced coma, and treated with drugs. He sends a link to that story. Right. All right. Dixon. Stephen writes, Good morning, tremendous twip trio. In the case of the 12-year-old <clears throat> male patient, Patient is presenting with classic meningitis symptoms, stiff neck, decreased CSF glucose, and nothing on the CSF bacterial and AFB cultures leans my diagnosis to a viral meningitis, especially if the differential performed on a CSF cell count, cytospin, and right stain showed predominant lymphocytes. This type of infection would show no increase in the eosinophil count, but since this fact was worthy of note and due to me writing into a show called This Week in Parasitism, <laughs> I am led to another diagnosis. <laughs> I postulate that this patient is presenting with Negleria phalari, a nasty protozoa that lives in warm, fresh water, infecting humans via the nasal pathway. It presents with many, if not all, of the same symptoms of meningitis. There is a chance to see the protozoa on a cytospin, but the amoeba quickly deteriorates. If Dixon's book, Parasitic Diseases, 5th edition, no, in Dixon's book. It's not just mine, but thank you for saying that. Um, <laughs> it is stated that there is little clinical experience with this usually fatal disease and that amphotericin B is the only known drug, but often uh, times diagnosis is made too late to be effective. Great work as always, Steve. Stephen, sorry, Stephen. All right, that does it. Everyone made the same guess, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
Daniel, what I else should say, we Everyone know? came to the same conclusion. They did after <laughs> pondering and pondering and pondering. <laughs> no, and, and this no is... No pun intended. You pondering. Know, and, and this is a... Uh, <laughs> No, and this is a tough case, you know, for for several reasons. One is, um, you know, the presentation is really almost indistinguishable from a bacterial meningitis. Young kid comes mm-hmm. in, he's got a stiff neck, he's got the, you know, just everything that goes along with the bacterial meningitis. So they, they did the right thing. Unfortunately, in this case, the boy very quickly died, and um, it was diagnosed at autopsy that it was. Um, Naglaria phalari. So uh, what were they treating him with for meningitis? Uh, they did um, ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and ampicillin. Mm. And uh, they're, they're, and actually, they did give dexamethasone right up front. There's um, a number of regimens that we'll use for treating meningitis mm-hmm. based um, in, in large part upon the age of the patient and also upon their immune status. Right. And so, you know, people over 50 or under a certain age will get um, ampicillin added on. Uh, the ceftriaxone is going to cover a lot of things, but we had the vancomycin because a lot of the strep that cause meningitis are becoming resistant yeah. to the levels of ceftriaxone we achieve in the CNS. So people always think like the vancomycin is there for staph, but it's actually there to treat um, the cephalus borne intermediate resistant uh, strep. And then the ampicillin you add for other microbes like Listeria, for instance. There's mm-hmm. okay, um, so but no, unfortunately, <clears throat> in this case, no um, response, right? No response. Child quickly deteriorated and died. And, and as we've, mm-hmm. as a lot of our emailers wrote in, um, let's say you knew coming in the door that we thought this was, um, then you probably would have treated with a combination of amphotericin B, miltefazine, maybe mm-hmm. even considered adding other things, the hypothermia. Um, it's hard to know because there's so little experience, you know, whether in this individual case that would have even made a difference if he had received all that treatment yeah, from yeah. day one. Yeah. So the teen in Florida who survived uh, got all of that, but we don't know if that was it or something else, right? I mean, the one thing I will say is that if you look through the addition of miltefazine, which is something we actually got from the Balamuthia experience, um, may be a, may be a critical... Um, medication in changing outcomes here Mm. uh temperature makes sense because as um, people have mentioned this is a um a protozoan a parasite that um, is very temperature sensitive and so so maybe dropping the temperature is a good idea right we tend to have a fever when we are ill but maybe in this case um the reverse is we want to have a drop a hypothermic response maybe it doesn't replicate as rapidly I think that's true. I think it may actually even die as you drop the temperature, uh, right. but clearly it's replicative um, index. It's amount of replications increase when you get to sort of this ideal temperature that it likes. Uh, people mentioned um, the mm-hmm. number of cases. This, even though it was in the newspaper recently, which is what made me think, oh, this is a good time to, to present this case. And actually I just happened to be seeing a case um, while this was in the newspaper. So that was the timing was, um, it's still not a very common diagnosis. No. Um, there have been little clusters in areas. There was an area in Virginia, and um, the children were swimming in an area that was warmed. Yeah. Um, it was outflow of a nuclear power plant. Wow. Um, mm. An area in Oklahoma where there were a number of cases. Georgia, there was a swimming hole in Georgia. And they've done a lot of studies sort of showing that um, the temperature is a critical, warm, fresh water is critical for this. But there's probably also something about the host, Right. Sure. How you enter the water or, you know, I think everybody else was swimming and they didn't get it. Yeah. I think because it's so rare, it would suggest that there's some genetic predisposition, immune yeah. defect of some sort. I've I'm going to give you um, a photo that I took on a river that I fish. And the, the rivers here are getting warm, too, because of the temperature rise in the air. Uh, and it shows a rope hanging off a branch of a big tree that hangs over the river. And I've actually been fishing upriver when people are actually diving off the rope into the river itself. And as the water temperature exceeds 70 degrees, 75, sometimes it gets it to 80, Yeah, uh, maybe there's a risk uh, even at that place. All right, so, so fresh water only. Only fresh water. So that the, is the moralist day in the salt. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, actually, you know, you remind me, what are my children doing today in Cape Cod is there's this place called the Punch Bowl, <laughs> and it is a small warm pond and there's a tree with a branch and a rope and they you reach out you pull the rope over and you get as high as you yeah, can yeah, you swing sure. way out and then they drop 
poor Barnaby. I don't know why, but he always tends to belly flop. And it's always my fault. I'm sure it's my fault, even though I'm not there at the moment. But they're probably getting water up their noses. But it doesn't go up that far north, does it, Dixon? Um, that says here in the reports that there was an impl- implication that the range for this disease is going north. Yeah, I think we're still north of it. I think yeah. we're but still I, we're at probably at the, at the edge of it. So this case in Florida, they the boy came in. It's, it was in Orlando. And they suspected, because of the geography, I guess, amoeba. So uh, the spinal tap revealed amoeba in the spinal fluid, mm-hmm. which wasn't the case in your case. Well, Dixon case, tried but, to sort of push on that. Did yeah. they see any sort of odd forms, any cells that they couldn't recognize? Motile. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they uh, lowered his temperature, induced a coma, and gave him these drugs. And miltefacine is uh, manufactured by a company in Orlando. So the son, really? the CEO's son delivered the drug within a few minutes to the wow. hospital. So wow. it, apparently it's not available globally yet, this drug, and uh, they're pushing for that. It's something. very it's very expensive is a tough thing. It was originally a breast cancer drug, right? Mm-hmm. And these are drugs they invent for some reason and then they yeah. realize yeah. does something different. I'm not even sure I fully understand exactly what it's doing to the amoeba. Yeah. But... Um, the, the cost is prohibitive. Um, fortunately, there are not a ton of these cases, right? Yeah. Um, so, Speaking of expensive drugs, I'm sure you know that EpiPens are in the news now because they're 600 bucks each. They used to be less than 100 bucks. And the, and the president of the AMA has just sent out an email today saying, we need to get this down a bit because that's a bit much. The co- there's one manufacturer in the U.S. of EpiPens. So if you're stung by a bee... <laughs> and you can't, uh, you can't, you, you got to get rid of them every year. They expire within a year. Mm-hmm. You know? How convenient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, you know, this is, I don't know if this is the soapbox for us to go up on, but it, <laughs> it really is tough. The concept that the free market, um, you know, should, should be completely free when it comes to life saving medications. And I told my wife this this morning, who spent many years in pharmacy, right? Pharmaceutical industry. And she said, well, it's not good to charge so much, but you need to know how often they're sued and how much they have to pay out because that may play into the price, and we don't know about this, right? Yeah. Or are there drugs that don't sell at all and you have to make up the difference somewhere? Yeah, we don't know the whole story. We never will, no, right? of course not. They're under a lot of pressure now. Yeah. We'll see if they respond. So can I ask where this case was? So this yeah. case, I was going to present a case um, from Virginia, but then when I saw this case in Thailand. Thailand, wow. Yeah, this was a boy living not far outside of um, Bangkok. Just when you were there recently. Just when I was there recently. Mm-hmm. So how many days from admission to death? It was, um, I think I wrote a down week? here. I think, no, no, not even. I think it was four days. Wow. Very quick. Poor kid. Um, and so I actually was, I went over, I um, have some pictures actually, I went over the um, brain um, uh, biopsy with the pathologist who was involved in the case. And you can actually see the amoeba hmm. in the in the brain tissue. So I think that these individuals definitely have some immune dysfunction and we should sequence their genomes and try to assess what's going on. I'll bet they do. It's so rare, Dixon. Yeah. And not even just for understanding this disease, but it gives us insights into the way the immune system works. Sure. I mean, what are we all doing right usually? What if, what if it's a physical difference? Could be, Dixon, but I'm a it's geneticist, a, man. No, no. There still might be a genetic <laughs> difference, but it might be a physical difference in the way their cribriform plate is arranged. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. <laughs> hey, I used to be one of those. Do you know what that, I bet you don't know what movie that's from. Oh. Right, I don't. Does anyone, I'm going to ask our listeners, back off, man. I'm a scientist. Oh, you know, that sounds <laughs> like so it. curious. I would guess. You want me to guess? <laughs> Ghostbusters. Yeah, good guess, Dixon. <laughs> now, our it's audience, a Columbia movie. What do you expect? Well, the first five minutes were at Columbia. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> Did you see the new one, by the way? No, I haven't seen I'm wondering it. if there's a reprise of Columbia. <clears throat> So how many of these- Barnard, have, they would have all gone to Barnard, not Columbia. <laughs> That's right. How many of these have you seen in your career? So- Personally, I've never had any of them come where I've actually been the direct consultant. So it's always been colleagues of mine that have uh, seen these. Because as mentioned, this is not in the New York, New Jersey area. Yeah, it's yeah. farther south. Oh. So it's Virginia. It's the Midwest. So um, I'm I'm practicing outside the zone, the endemic zone. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you could say that of something that is as uncommon as uh, Nagleria infection. There was a, an interesting twist to this, and I think we mentioned this on a previous twip. The uh, the baths, the Roman baths in Bath, England, mm-hmm. 
were shown to have this amoeba. And so they drained the baths. And in doing so, they uh, scraped the bottom to get it clean. And they started to see all these trinkets that were thrown in by women of Roman soldiers wishing them good luck and good hunting and yeah. watch out for the Scots and, <laughs> and that yes. sort of thing. Um, it was a treasure trove for archaeologists. Were people getting infected? No, they just discovered the amoeba, so they decided to shut down the baths until they um, cleared out the... Now, um, when was this? In Roman era? Uh, no, 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 no. This was Much recent, like in the 60s or 70s, something like that. I'll find the yeah. reference and I'll put it up. I visited the baths in Bath. Yeah. And there's a restaurant right there and they have... You go in there, glasses on the table. You can sip the water. (laughs) (laughs) Through your cribiform plate. Yeah, right. (laughs) No, that was served on a cribiform plate. It was. Very good, Dixon. Anything else we need to know, Daniel? No, that's it. I think think that's it. I want to tell you about the first sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. Dixon, have you checked it out? (laughs) I have, actually. Really? Yeah, no, I, I actually was on that before you even mentioned it. I joined it a long time ago. I bow to you, Dixon. No, don't, don't, please don't do that. <laughs> You're right. I'll hurt my back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the first ad-free nonfiction streaming service in the world. It's founded by John Hendricks. Do you know what he founded, Dixon? John Hendricks. You know, you've only heard this ad for two months. <laughs> He's founded Discovery Communications. <laughs> now, would you say that Discovery is fiction or nonfiction? For the most part, it's nonfiction. That's right. That's right. It's more sciencey stuff, right? Yeah. Don't don't mess with me. I'm a scientist. <laughs> Back off, man. I'm a scientist. I love that. I Back think it's great. Here's another one. <laughs> Let's go up to the lab and see what's on the slab. <laughs> no, you're not going to get That's that. That's probably one. Young Frankenstein. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'll, I'll give that to our listeners. Over 1,500 titles and 600 hours of content. 196 countries. Of course, all the countries that TWIP goes to, and you can. Watch this streaming service on the web on your device, whether it be a Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Kindle, or Apple TV. And for our audience, they have a wide variety of science and technology content. They also have a lot of other stuff like nature, history, interviews, and so forth. It's, it's all real stuff. It's not, non, it's not fiction. It's not reality TV. Exactly. They also have ultra It's reality. Day. It's not It's TV. reality. <laughs> They also have <laughs> ultra high definition, 4K, over 50 hours, one of the largest on the internet. Their library includes Stephen Hawking's universe. He traces the history of astronomical theories. I like Stephen Hawking very much. He's um, really, you know, he, he means really well. Indeed. And he's serious about teaching science. Next World with Michio Kaku. I love the way he uses his hands. <laughs> right. They have they have episodes on viruses. Did I look last time to see if there were any parasites? I don't know. You remember? I know we discussed looking. Right. CuriosityStream.com. Let's check it out. <clears throat> of course, they will ask me to log in. Not I want to really. preview it. Yeah, let's just preview it so I don't have to sign in and right. do a lot of malarkey. Here we go. What should we put in? Uh, amoeba? Or malaria. They might malaria. Have malaria. Okay, malaria. No malaria. Oh, dear. How about amoeba? <clears throat> nope. Um, How about parasite? Just worms. Yeah, they <laughs> have Life on Us. Oh, okay. Two episodes. Right. And Nature's Weirdest Events. Three three, oh. uh, sees three episodes. See, the, there is a show that the Discovery Channel does feature, and that is Monsters Inside Me. And that's all about parasites, and those are real cases. And I'm the science advisor for that show, Dixon. so she, they might have that on. They have a series on vertical farms. It's called Cities of Tomorrow. I've seen it. Three episodes. Yeah, I've seen it, and it's really wow. interesting. There you go, Dixon. How about that? <clears throat> you know, <laughs> it's with, out of control. With Curiosity Stream, you get real science, not reality TV. They have monthly and annual plans available, starting at just two ninety nine a month, less than a cup of water. You buy a bottle of water here in New York; it's more than two ninety nine, right, Dixon? Well, it can be. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up and you will get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIP. You notice I have a little bit of a cold, Dixon? I do. I, I Isn't that cold, weird, a summer uh, cold? You know what Ogden Nash said about that? 
There's nothing glummer than a cold in summer. That's what he said. He liked to make rhyming he things, did. huh? He did. He did. Well, I'll tell you, my son started with right. a sore throat. Oh. And then a few days later, I, I got the same thing. And then a few days after that, uh, my wife. Infectious diseases. So he was, um, what is what do we call? Uh, case zero. <laughs> yeah, case zero, right. All right, this, we have a, a cool paper today. We do, we do. It's just recently published in Science, and uh, the title is Detection of the Plant Parasite, Cushuta Reflexa by a Tomato Cell Surface Receptor. Right. And the authors are Hegenauer, Furst, Kaiser, Smoker, Zipfel, Felix, Stahl, and Albert from the University of Tübingen and the uh, Norwich Research Park in the UK. Right. And this is about a plant that is a parasite of plants. Dixon, is that even possible? Absolutely. <laughs> no, we, we know lots of them. Cushuta reflexa, also known as... You don't know? Do you know, Daniel? No. Daughter. Daughter, that's right. Daughter. And you know what, Dixon? Daughter, daughter. It wraps around yeah, yeah, yeah. and I've it watched, pierces and, and sucks things out of I've the... I've watched time-lapse photograph of this. And, and Dixon, <laughs> it's amazing. Do you... Here's a here's an amazing revelation. We actually talked about daughter on twip number seventy seven. <laughs> the name of the episode was Mixed Messages, which was your name because it was brilliant. Because what happens is that these uh, parasites wrap their shoots around the plant. They pierce the cell wall, mm -hmm. and in this Hostoria. paper they showed exchange of RNAs between the plant and the parasite. I, I oh. do you came that. up I do with the brilliant. That title of mixed messages right dixon on. because message, uh, message yeah, 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 RNA, yeah, you no, get it no, no. <laughs> well do i get my own joke sure <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well it was a long time ago it was that's true well i'm an old daughter what, what can i talk <laughs> <laughs> oh that's we have to make a title out of that <laughs> dixon's an old daughter can we do that no <laughs> no you're no, too dixon, proud dixon can only say those things no one else <laughs> but you are you are an old daughter i'm not and i'm old. approaching old daughter in today's and world daniel is way far away from old daughter i hope i hope you're cool. less than 70 right uh yes <laughs> <laughs> so we have a nice mixed bag of ages in this group that's nice parasitic plants yes are a threat to crops there are four thousand species of parasitic plants i bet i know a way of avoiding them <laughs> <laughs> uh, put everything in a vertical farm. That's the deal. That is true. You feel that people are not listening to you? Is that the problem? No, I think they are listening to me. Mm. I think they are. In fact, I, yeah. So this genus sure. in this paper, Cusciuta, I love that name, Cusciuta sure. reflexa. Right. It's Italian. <laughs> it's a stem holoparasite. Uh -huh. What is a holoparasite, Dixon? Uh, that's a very good question. I've never heard that term before okay. because they use that only in plant biology, I think. What is a dicot? A dicot is a uh, kind of plant. There are monocotyledons and dicotyledons. And when the seed from the monocotyledon comes up, it produces a single leaf. When a dicotyledon comes up, it produces two. Okay. Now, a holoparasite yes. is a parasitic organism that cannot complete its life cycle without exploiting a suitable host. I don't know any parasites that are not holoparasites. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the definition of a parasite is. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't get that definition then. Anyway, you know? um, I, it must be more than that. It must apply to pa plants, though, because, you know, you think of like mistletoe yeah. and some other parasitic plants like Spanish moss. Uh, those are epiphytes that sort of live on the branches of other plants, and they parasitize them by uh, simply occupying space that would ordinarily be occupied by the plant itself. So there's no parasite that could live by itself, That's with, you know? And not need a How host. Could that work? Then it would. Well, sometimes it, it finds be. a host. And those are those are called facultative parasites. Yeah, facultative parasites. Right. So, so that's the holo parasites. Whole. That's a funny. Term. So my my understanding of the holo parasite distinction is that the whole parasites have evolved to the point where they've actually given up their own ability to photosynthesize. Mm -hmm. So the hemi parasites can still they still have big, photosynthetic yeah. machinery, but the whole parasites have basically said, you know what, I don't need that anymore, and they're getting all of their energy from the other plant that they're parasitizing, which still has photosynthetic machinery. Right. So you can understand why that doesn't really cross over into the animal world, because we wouldn't give up photosynthesis, never had it. So That's true. Although I have seen some people that I thought were plants, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so this um, Kushuta genus, there are 200 species. Yeah. They're obligate 
stem parasites. They wrap around the stems of plants. Um, and what they do is the seedlings, which grow in the ground, obviously, they can sense volatile organics emitted by the they host. Get the they scent. go towards it. That's right. And they grow and they wrap around. That's amazing. They penetrate and connect to the vascular system. Well, that's of called the a hostoria. Mm-hmm. That connection is What is that again? Hostoria. It's exactly. Hostoria. Exactly. And then they take things out and they also put things in. Right. Like viruses can go right. back and forth, right. too. A side note. Please. Deciduous forests. Deciduous, as opposed to... Coniferous. Coniferous. So deciduous forests. When you look at the root systems, they're all connected. Every tree of a deciduous forest of a given biome is mm-hmm. connected, and they're connected by hostoria. Uh-huh. So that they exchange, they're exchange. they sort of like a commune of trees. They all have about the same level of water in their root systems, the same level of sap. They in their, share it, really? They do share it. So when one tree dies, do the others feel pain? <laughs> or do they hear it fall in the woods? Um, no, if the, you inject radioactivity at one end of a forest, that's how they you, found you it. can find it that's in the exactly other That's exactly how they found Neat. it. Wow. They did see 14, and, and you can trace it. So that's as opposed to tropical forests. Well, these are deciduous temperate zone forests. Mm-hmm. In the tropics, however, none of the root systems are connected, and it's all competition. Hmm. So you have these holistic... Wonderful tree hugger <laughs> trees <laughs> living in the northern temperate zones. And then you've got these tropical deciduous, they're still deciduous trees. They flower. Everything else, angiosperm mm. type trees that compete like hell for the canopy and the nutrients on the bottom and everything else. So quite different approaches to solving the yeah, same problem. Yeah. And it relates to the depth of the soil and the length of the growing seasons. So these parasitic plants need to. Uh, get nutrients they from do. their hosts, otherwise they don't survive. That's right? correct. Now, uh, interestingly, tomato is tomato. is resistant. How about that? Uh, the, not just tomatoes in the paper, and I know you're going to get to this, uh, but maybe I'll be a spoiler. Yeah, can can you do a tomato spoiler? <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> a rotten tomato. Yeah, don't spoil the tomatoes. <laughs> the wild parent strains, yeah. of tomatoes, which come from South America, probably Peru, just like the potato. So sometimes you get those two words mixed up. <laughs> They're totally susceptible to this infection. Really? So breeding has made resistance. So the domestic form of tomatoes are totally resistant, and it's just the mm-hmm. opposite of what you would expect to find when you domesticate something out of the wild. So remarkable. Interesting. Very interesting. Remarkable. You know, we talked about tomatoes uh, on TWIV not too long ago, and this came up. So in this paper, they want to know why tomatoes are resistant to these exactly. daughters, right? And um, so they say... When, when plants are assaulted, they respond very much like mammals. When you're infected, you get an innate response yes. initially. You produce cytokines and interferons and so forth. And plants do a similar thing, right? They respond by making um, ethylene, right? They do. And they also hyperoxygenate. Hyperoxygenate. They make reactive oxygen. That's species. right. And, so what would ethylene and, do? With, if a plant's assaulted and it makes ethylene, what's the function of that? Perhaps that's an anti-pheromone. Perhaps it actually convinces the daughter that it's on the wrong plant, and it just drops off. Okay. So the uh, I was going to say something else here, but I lost It'll my come train back. of thought. It'll come back. I hope so. <laughs> so they made extracts of the daughter, okay? They did. And they asked, do plants respond to these extracts? Right. You just grind them up and make extracts. Oh, wait, I know what else I was going to say. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that in addition to these ethylene and hyperoxygenation responses to stress yeah, yeah. and then in this case it's a parasite stress they also produce a group of compounds called flavoline mm-hmm. flavonoids flavonoids, right, flavonoids. Right. and that's what makes the plant taste good mm. so interestingly enough a little bit of stress is good a lot of stress you're going to lose the plant okay so basically they find if you take this extract of the daughter and you apply it to different plants um, only the tomato Right. Responds by making ethylene. That's what they assayed in exactly. this one experiment. Exactly. Exactly. The so S lycopersicum. What does the S stand for? Do you remember in tomato? Salvanina. 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 Okay, that's tomato. And the other yeah. plants, including Nicotania, uh, tobacco. But that's in the same general family of tomato plants. I didn't know that tobacco and tomatoes really? were related. Petunia, S tuberosum, yeah. S penelili. <laughs> Penelili, wait a minute. Penelli, 
Hey, it's a macaroni. A penelope. <laughs> Penelli. Anyway, right. those don't respond. No. So looks like a tomato. So specific. So specific. Right. Now, this, the, the active ingredient is heat, is heat labile. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. It's heat stable at 95 degrees. Right. Heat stable. So you take the extract and heat it up and then apply it. It's First step active. of knowing what it is, right? But it's sensitive to uh, what? Protease. protease. So what does that mean? Well, it's probably a peptide or protein. Yeah. Peptide, right. <laughs> it's a wild guess. It's just I think a that, wild I think guess. you can go with that. It's probably peptide. <laughs> no, it's would, present would, throughout Or at the least plant. there's a peptide backbone Well, involved, we say right? peptide. It could be a protein, but... Yeah, protein is part of it because yeah. it's yeah. obviously cleaving it. And it's in all parts of the daughter. Your shoot, tips, yeah. stems, yeah. hostoria, uh -huh. and in flowers. Right. You imagine that these parasites make flowers. They have to look beautiful still to bees or whoever is pollinating them, yes. So it's uh, and it's associated with the cell wall because it can be released from the cell wall by acid. There you go. They found it in six different Cushuta species, but not in uh, Arabidopsis, Nicotania, yeah. Lycoprosecum. Uh, so they show this is very specific. Yeah. Active factor seems to be common to Cushuta species, but absent from plants outside the genus. And they wanted to purify it, so they made extracts and did various chromatographies, assaying the fractions by stimulating ethylene uh, induction in, in the plant. And hyperoxygenase. And hyperoxygen. And, and I they, think instead of it, we should call it this really cool name, which I thought the Cuscuda factor, right? I mean, that could, be like, factor. that could be like a movie. That's the right. Cuscuda oh, factor. Could that be the title of our... I, I would, the, I would listen to that Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You betcha. The Cuscuda factor. <laughs> That's right. So... Uh, in their fractionations, they got to a certain point, and they found it's a heterogeneous mix of compounds. Yeah, that it's not was just one good. thing. That was a little disturbing to right? see that, actually. I mean, they, they actually could purify a single compound of a specific molecular weight that had the activity, but there were also right. other fractions that had the activity. But well. they got such little amounts that they could yeah. not subject it to a mass spec, mass spec analysis to find out what the sequence exactly, was. Exactly, exactly. But they did say in the end... The activity is associated with a small peptide from Cushuta. Right. Then they did a very cool experiment. They have hybrids between uh, resistant and yeah. sensitive plants like that. with different parts of the chromosomes exchanged. <laughs> exactly. They call this an introgression library of Lycopersicum, which is the one that's resistant, versus yeah. Pinelli. You don't want to know how many chromosomes these plants have. Pinelli. Tons of them in You know role. Pinelli, Racinelli? Really? Is that a distant cousin? <laughs> so they just take each hybrid, which has a little bit of chromosome exchange, and they ask which part of the chromosome is needed to be able to respond to the Cushuta factor. Mm -hmm. So they identify a small chromosome region yeah. uh, with 800 plus genes. Right. Five of these encode cell surface proteins. So they simply take each of those and produce them in cells and ask which one gives you the Cushuta factor that's, responsiveness. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's right. That's Isn't right. that beautiful? Yeah. They actually put the genes into Nicotania because tobacco is very easy to yeah. manipulate genetically. And they have a single gene that in, that confers Cushuta factor responsiveness. It's a wonderful name. S-O-L-Y-C-O-8-G-O-1-6-2-7-0. -O -G -O <laughs> yes. It just rolls off your tongue. <laughs> which they rename... Um, uh -oh. What do they call it? Cushuta Receptor 1. Right. Cure 1. Yes. Cure. C-U-R-E. Isn't right. that cure? Right, right. Cure right. 1. <laughs> uh, and they, they show that this is it. This protein yep. gives you responsiveness uh, in other plants that don't normally respond. Another interjection. And here. by the way, Dixon, it is a cell surface. It is a membrane protein. It is. You know, plant cells have membranes. They do. Of course I know yeah. that. Okay. What were you going to say, Dixon? I know that. I think this is so cool. So I, do, I visited a vertical farm in Texas where this little tobacco plant that they just mentioned is being used as the receptor for various gene constructs yeah. that they want to produce lots of, let's say, insulin or factor nine or things of this sort. So this little plant is quite useful for lots of things. And, and look at they're using it as their genetic test system. I like Neat. It. I like it a lot. So this is a, <coughs> a membrane protein, uh, and it has a leucine-rich repeat, right. and it's a receptor-like protein, yeah. and it also has two receptor-like kinases. A helical transmembrane domain. Is that <clears throat> typical for trans domains? I think it's just loops ordinarily, but this is a helical. Helix is unusual for a transmembrane. That's what I thought. Yeah. 
And so they don't really know what this protein normally does, but it's apparently a receptor for um, the Kushuta factor, and they do co-immunoprecipitation experiments to show that you know they're binding together, and you can use an antibody to the protein and bring down the Kushuta factor with it. So they're clearly binding. But how the binding leads to the response of the plant to make ethylene and reactive oxygen species, that's the next You know, I think the immune system of plants is very very poorly defined so far. Of course. Very poorly defined. But it, it, it's, it's more than one thing. So, in fact, here they say the resistance against the daughter and the yep. tomato is involving more than this uh, cure one because right. they have some uh, hybrids between the two plants that lack this gene. They're still somewhat resistant to mm-hmm. the daughter, so there must be other things as well. That's true. Well, that's not surprising, right? Right. So here we have... Tomato is resistant to a daughter because um, it uh, has a receptor for a, an, a, a small peptide in the daughter plant, right. cell membrane receptor, which yeah. somehow triggers, triggers the, the response, response that gets, says, get out of here, and doesn't allow the daughter to attach. It never gets Isn't those, what do you call those, haustoriums? Haustoria. Haustoria into the mm-hmm. tomato. Yeah. So they say at the end, identification of cure one thus provides a starting point for studying and managing parasitic plant infestation. So Dixon, you could take this gene and make transgenic uh, plants, right? Look at you, look at you. And they would be resistant, but people would not want to eat them, of course. <laughs> because they're all transgenic. <laughs> no, but the other thing about this is that it's not a total 100% protection. And so that's It isn't troubling. 100%. So they, ask, they, they make an analogy here in the paper between mammalian immunity and plant immunity, saying that there's an innate immune response, which this might be, and then there's an acquired immune response, which they have yet to discover. And maybe the other part of resistance that equals total resistance by the tomato plant is when you add in the acquired immune response Mm -hmm. genes, Mm -hmm. but they don't know what they produce because... So I was going to tell you one more response of a plant to infection, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and which has revolutionized our view of life. Mm Mm-hmm. Can you guess what it is, Vincent? One more. Oh, yes. Uh, RNAi, right? Oh, Inter- RNA it's interference. Simpler. It's very simple. This is a RNA very simple interference. Thing. Well, that's complicated. <laughs> simpler than RNA interference? <laughs> that's very complicated. No, it's the produce production of um, resin, mm-hmm. plant resins, which results in the formation of amber. And you can see the numbers of things that are trapped in it. That all comes from plants. And it's as a response to a damage mm-hmm. on the plant itself. And so then this sticky, oozy stuff comes out and traps the offending whatever. Of course, it traps everything else, and that's the basis for Jurassic Park uh, biology and a lot of other stuff. So I just wanted to mention that because plants are are widely known for those sorts of things. Uh, Milkweed plants, for instance, uh, you know, they give off the sap that traps things in them. Yeah. But, you know, you thought of them as very unsophisticated animals, but this is clearly something yeah, that's pretty, way beyond. It's not fair to say that. Dixon, how many plants are susceptible to these daughter parasites? Do you know? Well, if you were to just ask how many flowering plants there are. Who cares about flowers? You don't eat them. Well, that's one of those flowers. Yes, you do. Every plant you eat is a flowering plant. <laughs> I thought you meant just flowers like roses. You don't. No, no, flowers. no, no. These are angiosperms. Which, which agriculturally about. important plants are susceptible to daughter? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I gather this is a global problem. So I think any... Any flowering plant, dicotyledons in this case, uh, are highly susceptible, except if you're a tomato farmer. Mm. <laughs> you know, you just happen to be so lucky that right. tomato picked up something, maybe from a virus. <clears throat> I got the answer. You do? All you have to do is look it up on the internet. All right. Dotter is parasitic on a number of agricultural crop species, including alfalfa, lespedeza, I don't know what that is, flax, clover, potatoes, chrysanthemum, dahlia. There you go. Trumpet vine, Just ivy, petunias. Going. I don't care about the flowers, but you know, petunia. We don't eat petunias, right? I don't, but some people might. My petunia, <laughs> you petunia. So it's obviously important. You know what? Instead of making transgenic plants, let's just build vertical farms. Here, here. Get rid of the daughter problem. That's right. You because <laughs> we don't have enough land anyway. At right. least that's what I've been told over the years. This so is, we're running out. That's for sure. We're using it up. You need to be more of an advocate. I do. You're right. I I, I don't talk enough about this. <laughs> 
I'm hoarse from that's thinking that's about Dixon's this. problem. He's too quiet over yeah, here. I, I thought that was a cool paper, didn't you guys? Yes. I, I thought, you know, I like the immunology of it, right? I mean, so they're sort of coming to this. And, and as, as we discussed, we understand a growing amount about the immune system in um, animals. Yeah. Right. And we're starting to understand more in plants. And so they, they start with kind of this framework of the idea that we have a system of um, molecular pattern um, sort of receptors, things that will recognize patterns of, and, and this is where the language is a little tough. Is it pathogens? Is it microbes? Is sure. it parasites? Yeah, sure. Is it invaders? I'm not sure exactly what it is, but that's sort of the first thing, because whether it's, are they sensing or detecting danger, pathogens, parasites? Um, and so we talk about PAMPs and DAMPs, and here they, they say MAMPs, microbe-associated molecular yeah, right, patterns. Right, right. But is the parasitic plant really a microbe? No. You know, no, it's actually, so it's a parasitic it's a, plant. It's, it's a, a macrobe. It's a It's a microbe, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and they're sort of crossing the line here between innate and adaptive when they talk about these um, leucine-rich repeats. Yeah. Because our earliest adaptive immune system, you know, you've got to produce millions of different um, right. pattern yeah. recognition receptors. So, yeah, is the, is the human genome or the plant genome or any animal genome big enough to produce the repertoire required? Usually not. So, there are these repeat motifs that, that are used that can sort of be sculpted, sculpted through experience. That's true. Yeah. So, um, how many different species of daughter are there? And then do they all produce the same peptide? Oh, oh is this like going to be the, yeah, maybe this is the universal uh, yeah, yeah. anti-daughter um, right. recognition motif. Well, Kushuta, which is daughter, sure. two, about 200 different species. Yeah. But and they all are, produce I think the there are 4,000 different kinds of parasitic plants. They're different. They're different species as well. So sure. I'd be surprised if the same molecule mechanism were involved with all of them, but they could check. It, this might have something to do with Hastoria formation. But remember, they looked at other non Kushuta daughters or parasitic species, and they don't have this uh, activating factor. No, but no. then they're, they're not attacked by them either because they're not common in the environment. So this is another reason for, forget about vertical farms for a moment, just think about soil-based farming. You know, there's other ways of growing food like hydroponic or aeroponic. The moment you eliminate soil... Yeah. You've eliminated a resource of pathogens as well as nutrients. But maybe you've also eliminated benefit. Well, in which way? Mm -hmm. You know, viruses and bacteria that are beneficial in the soil. Say how. You get rid of them. Tell me how. There's some, work. Well, many plant <laughs> virologists have evidence that plant viruses are helpful to crops. For example, they confer thermal tolerance and drought tolerance. You see, those are things I wouldn't even consider important indoors. Because you're not heating or drying them out, right? Yeah. But out in the wild, they're yeah, no, that's important outside. I agree, <clears throat> but inside, I think. Well, just I just don't want us to oversimplify. No, I'm not Although, oversimplifying. But um, when you look at the results from years of experience in the laboratory of trying to define what plants actually need in order to grow, mm -hmm. you're left with 16 elements. Plus and none of those elements of are viruses, right? <laughs> I would say that's true. I would, I would have to guess. And you couldn't tell the difference between a plant that was grown that way and a plant that came from the outside. There's no way to tell. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that you can do very well in a vertical farm indoors with defined you know, just, medium. Uh, yeah. just, have a vertical just indoors. Just indoors. Just indoors. Yeah. Hydroponic or aeroponic. You eliminate soil and you've eliminated a source of worry for your productivity. Got it. All right, let's do another case study. Absolutely. I bet, da okay. I bet Daniel has one. I I'm do. sure. I do, one. I do. <laughs> All right. Um, this one will be um, more challenging. How about that? Oh, People like ready it. for that? Oh, we like it. Yeah, we are thinking um, caps are Does it have a better outcome? <laughs> yes. You don't, you don't have to tell us. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I'm going to. <laughs> so, Anything uh, other than what happened last time uh, would be a okay. better outcome. <laughs> so this is, this is a case from Thailand. It's a 32-year-old Thai man um, from the southern coastal part of Thailand. And he comes in to be seen in Bangkok, comes to the infectious disease hospital, with a story of two months of watery diarrhea. Uh, he has significant weight loss, and he looks emaciated. And, and just to give you a sense of when, when I first, first saw the man, I thought, oh my gosh, this looks like end-stage um, AIDS, HIV, just to give you a sense of you know, what's happened to this man in just a period of two months. 
He reports that he has diarrhea about 10 times per day. And he actually, this gives you a sense of his economic situation. He says he has trouble flushing um, the feces in the toilet, right? So he's actually got a flush toilet. He's having trouble flushing it down. He's saying um, it floats, in other words. Um, he, uh, <laughs> we'll let you ask that question later. <laughs> okay. He reports that he eats normal fare, normal, you know, he's, he's Thailand, so normal fare, like, Boat noodles, somtam, you know, fish sauce, normal. pickled it's fish, vegetables, rice. You know all the all the stuff that uh, you know people would people would eat there. And so the first question that occurred to me, they're all I, cooked foods, right? Well, the first question that occurred to me when I heard this was, you said he eats somtam. What's somtam, right? And so uh, so I immediately had to that night that I heard go and eat somtam because <laughs> the only way to really know what something is is to experience it. Uh, and um, sometimes is an interesting dish. And, and what are the critical? What are the critical features for us to know about? Um, is this fish sauce is often made of raw fish that's mashed together, and they make this fish sauce. So there's an exposure to uncooked, and then then there may or be some degree of a fermenting process that may occur in mm -hmm. there. They also like um, to have somtam with salted crab. And the crab is again not particularly cooked, but salted. Mm. Okay. Now none of this may be relevant. <clears throat> yes, of course. <laughs> because you know the funny thing is you're in Thailand and he's eating what people in Thailand eat. So he's not eating. everybody shows up to the so, hospital looking know, like and, he does. You know, and so but you know, and in two months you got to realize. Think about what things we think about. But this man in two months says is now looking like he's in a concentration camp. Right. You know, the protuberant belly. He looks wasted. Um, okay, so I have pictures here of the Sumtam restaurant that I went to that night. And <laughs> it was a good and, Well, you Sumtam? know, it was called the Sumtam restaurant, <laughs> and uh, it was uh, in Siam Square there in Bangkok. Nice. And I have to say, you know, you, you hear these stories, you're like, why would anyone eat these things? You know, it's just not safe. And then you eat the Sumtam. <laughs> And I had some more of it last night in Providence, That's actually. Delicious. And it's really good. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so you okay. understand. Right. Okay. More information on this man. Past medical history, surgery, allergies. You know, it's all negative. There's there's nothing nothing exciting going on. This was a healthy um, fisherman who is now in two months afflicted with this. Doesn't take any medication. He works a very successful fisherman. As we mentioned, he's got a flush toilet, so he's... Got a somewhat nice accommodation. Does he have a family? He is married um, with his wife and has children. They're all healthy. Everybody else is doing okay. Um, he you know, he actually is a, doesn't have any bad habits. He doesn't smoke or drink. Um, he lives just in that small um, uh, southern coastal uh, village. Is he monogamous? Um, he is monogamous. You know, and is we asked we asked those things because we asked those things because you know the first thing that came into my mind when I saw him and was HIV, right? oh my gosh I, I need to know his HIV status and I will tell you that he's HIV negative mm -hmm. right. okay I mean that that was important does he remember um, doing anything unusual before the onset of this diarrhea no he you know I, and you ask all those questions about did you eat anything different or go somewhere go different? somewhere different no. or no there's there's nothing so he's uh, a fisherman he doesn't eat fish that he pulls out of the sea raw right. Well, he doesn't eat, you know, he doesn't, he, they get prepared and, you know, and then he no, but has, when you're a fisherman, you know, you got these, you can cut the cheeks out and pop them in with a little vinegar, you know, <laughs> people like to do that. He doesn't do that. He does not describe doing that. <laughs> no. All right. But no, that's like, that's a good thing to bring that up. Was, was this a rapid onset of diarrhea? So it's rapid onset. It's been going on for two months. And as I mentioned on physical exam, um, he, he's really a thin, um, wasted, uh, emaciated looking man mm -hmm. with this protuberant um, belly. But his liver and spleen are not enlarged. It's it's basically an abdominal bloating. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple other things, and then I'm going to ask you guys to ask me some more questions. Um, we do an abdominal X-ray of him, and you see, you actually see that it's an abdominal X-ray with contrast. So you've got contrast in the GI tract, and you see what appears to be a loss of the villi. The villi are those little finger-like projections. So loss of villi, villi, flattened villi. So he's uh, suffering malabsorption syndrome, probably. But you you asked that about whether or not the the stool floats. Why why did you ask that, Dixon? What were you what were you kind of what were you thinking? Well, the diagnosis would be too simple for that, but um, you know. But you're thinking like a fat malabsorption, like a malabsorption, so yeah, steatorrhea. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, and that's something that you know when we lose our ability to absorb particularly fats, sure. 
then the stool will will float. Fat fat floats. Does it? Does his stool float? His stool does float, but it, it's it's so watery. You're not seeing chunks like I think we've talked about with Giardia, where the the stool is still formed, and you see sort of formed stools, but they're floating. How's his appetite? Um, he's hungry. What made him come so late? He, his disease. Oh, it did not get better. <laughs> <laughs> Every day it get better. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll go. He's a, he's so a, he doesn't have a fever, right? No, no, no fever. Gonna give us no, any any bloods? Or any? No abdominal pain. Um, no, no, not actual, not actual pain. And you made him recite everything he ate because I don't want to see your paper. Yeah, you know how to look at. You can't look at my stuff, I, and I can't look at your stuff. But I just no. And actually, we're gonna we're gonna go right ahead, and next time we're gonna do a a diagnostic test that's gonna tell us what this guy has. Um, we're already, you know, we're we're in a certain area where this um, this disease is endemic quite common actually so we already have a suspicion just sort of being in the right area we don't have blood in our diarrhea right no no blood in the diarrhea this is an upper secretory diarrhea upper gi secretory why do you say upper GI? well because it's watery and um they're expressing lots of fluid and there's another parasite that we've discussed in the past which uh cryptosporidium which has a similar pattern except no steatorrhea associated with it so that would be different but um and usually it would lessen over time if the patient was not immunocompromised whereas this is not going away it is not going away not gonna go away um is he um so other than the diarrhea he's otherwise fine he's not tired or he's not um anemic look well you know as, as dixon did ask the question of, so what finally <clears throat> brought him in you know and i i said oh because you know, it wasn't getting better but he is he's beginning to feel like he cannot work and mm-hmm. so his inability and that's actually what really brings people in often is they say you know i can't work this diarrhea has been going on for two months and so he feels now too weak to work too weak to work too okay. weak to work uh, but he um he still eats and drinks right he's trying to um, but, you know, as he says, it just all comes right out. But it doesn't throw, it doesn't vomit. No, no vomiting. No vomiting. Right. And so you have lab data that will pin this down, don't you? Well, that's what we're going to ask people to <laughs> to suggest. You know, here here you are, resource limited part of the world. You don't want right. to just do, you know, that's you, know you want to say, what do you think it is? Can we pin that down? Maybe treat it. He gets better and we say, phew, um, you know. We want to avoid the million dollar workup if we can. <laughs> what if you treat it and you're wrong, but it still gets better? That's fine too. No, I, I actually <laughs> you'll never know. No, no. In this case, we want a diagnosis. We, yeah, we sure do. You know, I, I try to make that a rule on TWIP yeah. is that I uh, I don't like the idea of we thought it was something and treated it and you got better. I, I want to actually yeah, see got it. Got it. a uh, a got it. Got it. lab verify. We talked about this before, and I it just experiences more and more when I when I go overseas and and see people is that the lab is so critical absolutely you, you know and particularly in these areas where you, know, you have sort of a hierarchical teaching where you know the senior person is this is what it is and then the people say this is what it is if you don't have that lab correcting at the senior level it, this <laughs> can trickle down um you, you need that i think you need that constant um constant correction constant uh feedback so you, you know what you're doing and in this case we're gonna we're gonna get that all right dixon you know what this is right I have suspicions, but I don't know okay. exactly what this is. I told Dixon he wouldn't get this. I told Dixon really? he's going to have to lick this yeah, one. Yeah, well, it's not. It's not one of the. It's it's a little less common I'm than sure. the classic ones that you you know. But yeah. if you go to this area, oh, that's what it is. But okay, all right. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. Before we finish up with some email, I do have another sponsor to tell you about. Okay. Nice. This, this would be Drobo. Oh, okay. Remember Drobo, Dixon? I do. I have one. You have one. I have a Drobo. I saw Drobo in your lab just the other day. I was in your lab, Vincent. <laughs> <clears throat> I drive a Drobo to work every day. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I do. They uh, Drobo gave us a unit to test out, and I must say that I've been remiss in not having set it up yet, but uh, I, I've been a little busy, so I have to get to it. But the plan is to put our data on it and have it shareable on the floor between my lab and me and so forth. So, um, But Drobo is a return sponsor. Welcome back, Drobo. It's a company that designs products to solve 
two problems that affect your hard disk drive. The hard drives get full and they will fail. And Drobo solves both of these problems because they're expandable. They are small storage units with multiple bays in which you put hard drives. And it fuses them all together, not physically, but <laughs> digitally, <laughs> to be a single drive that you see. And you can put two drives in or three drives in. As, as long as you're filling it up, you can just add more and more drives up to the capacity of the unit. It's not. You may recognize this as some kind of RAID, but this is not traditional RAID because it's a proprietary RAID that Drobo has developed uh, in which you can use different size hard drives. And it will tell you when... The drives are getting full. It has green lights on the bottom. As, as they turn orange, they're about 80% full, and you have to put a new drive in. And when it's red, it's full. You can't do anything else. <laughs> so Dixon can use it because Mine it's are like, green. Uh, yours are all green, <laughs> and they've never been any other color, right? I don't have You need to put stuff. more stuff on it. I, I got to get busy. You're right. Take more pictures. There you go. Because if you can read a traffic light, you can read a Drobo. You're right on right? Um, So it knows how much room you have. It's also redundant. Let's say you have two hard drives in a Drobo, mm -hmm. right? So they're fused as one. You copy data on. If one of those drives fails, you can just take it out, put a new one in, and your data will be restored to it because it's redundant. It's actually on both drives. Nice. It's duplicated. If you have five drives and one or two fails, you can do the same thing. So it's, it's data aware, it's redundant, it's expandable, and it's simple. They make a whole family of different products, eight different products. If you're a photographer, they have models for you. If you need portability, they have a mini Drobo, which you can bring out in the field with you. If you need a lot of storage, they have up to 12 bay units. And they also have networked attached storage, which is the one that Daniel saw that I plug into the Ethernet and you can share it. Sounds like it would be ideal for hospitals for record keeping. Because that's a lot of data. Are you talking about medical records? I am. <laughs> the ones you listen to at night to put yourself to sleep. I suppose it would be. <laughs> you know, I had an experience like you're describing where <clears throat> this was back when I was doing my, I call it my groundbreaking work in medical records <laughs> stuff. Um, <laughs> and real we, had, too. we had a RAID system with multiple hard drives. And one, one day, one of those hard drives, mm -hmm. you know, crashed, as they say. It made this noise. And, <laughs> and it was the whole, you know, writing that data now to the other drives. And yeah. You know, no, this is critical when you're when you're keeping um, really important yeah. information like patient records or science. Yeah, yeah. Of course, patient records, you not only have to have an on-site storage, but you need an off-site backup in case the site burns Very down. True. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You got to have redundant multiple backups. So they have multiple units at Drobo. And uh, you can, if you are listening to this podcast, you can save $100 off on the purchase of a mini a Drobo 5D, a 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system. Go to drobostore.com and use the discount code microbe100. Boy, I would like a 12 drive system. <laughs> oh, that'd be so cool. <laughs> Not sure what I'd do with it, but it would be so cool. It would like burns two a lot of gas. I would like it two of them. a lot of gas. <laughs> oh, that would be so cool. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIP. We have a few emails here. We do. Now, the first one... It's from Anthony. And Dixon, I don't know if you remember, but a few episodes ago, we were talking about coprophagy. Of course. So Anthony writes, I happened to cross a booklet on dog feeding by Leon F. Whitney, published in 1960, that contains a section on coprophagy. The author mentions a related condition, geophagy, in yeah. people that can be due to hookworms. Mm. Despite the name, not only dirt, but any number of unusual items might be eaten. An example is given of a young man who was afflicted with geophagy, which came from a hookworm infestation. He ate a whole Bible and <laughs> was halfway through a second when he was treated. So Anthony asks, should copies of scripture come with the caveat for external use only? <laughs> By the way, Whitney was a central figure in American eugenics. Oof. Do you know what eugenics are, Dixon? Yes, I a philosophy advocating the improvement of human genetic traits through the promotion of higher rates of sex of people with desired traits. Boy is from Brazil. It's as if you knew what a desired trait was and who had it, right? Exactly. exactly. So I, I think the problem, he shouldn't have been eating the um, Bible because I think we think this is driven by an iron deficiency. So he should have been maybe reading Candide, something with a lot more irony in it. 
I okay. think you should read. <laughs> I think you should re- eat your textbook. Sixth Ooh. edition. <laughs> I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm melting. You should eat a. Uh, you should eat a hematology textbook. Is it really that the hookworm causes? Uh, That's what we think. People who have an iron deficiency anemia clay, they eat a lot of clay. often develop this. Um, yeah, they're they're driven to to eat dirt. <laughs> animals and, and animals I've always do I've always lot. wondered if this wasn't somehow you know. And I think we've talked about this before. Even though the hookworm, you're not getting it through ingestion. Whether there's some sort of you know yeah. evolutionary drive. But. Well, I know that there's a series of South American parrots that eat a fruit which has a very high toxicity level, mm-hmm. or I believe it's arsenic, but I could be wrong on the on the element. But it's one of those uh, highly toxic uh, heavy metals. And so periodically they go to these cliffs which are solid clay cliffs, and they scrape the clay off and they swallow it, and they absorb out the toxins from their gut tract because they're very slow at digestion because they're obligate plant eaters. And uh, and the elephants seek out dirt that's rich in certain minerals that they're lacking in most of their diet. How do these animals figure all this out? It's absolutely amazing. It's sort of programmed in. I mean, we we see that the eating of dirt or the chewing of ice cubes. or I I wonder if it's so much learned or, you know. It's well, I think with elephants, uh, it's learned. But it's interesting that he picked the Bible to eat. Yes. Uh, uh, again, well. a bad choice. Dixon. <laughs> All right, here we the go. Peter writes, Hi, substitute standard nomenclature. In episode <laughs> thir- th- uh, 100, 113, Vincent decried the lack of non-commercial news. Well, there are probably... S- the, there are probably several, but my favorite, note British-Australian spelling, <laughs> is democracynow.org. It is a non-commercial, but some might say ideologically driven. However, you will hear stories you won't hear elsewhere, and sometimes months before the MSM mainstream media hear about it. For example, they were reporting, in parens, with some minor inaccuracies on Flint, Michigan, months before it became the big story that it is, slash was. Chair, Pete from Sydney, Strain. Strange. <laughs> right, P.S. From Google, quotes, a twip, abbreviating 20th of a point, 20th of an inch point, or 20th of an imperial point, citation needed, is a typographical measurement defined as 1 20th of a typographical point. So we are typographical point. 1 20th of a typographical One point. 1 20th of a typographical point. <laughs> so we should rename <laughs> our twi- podcast w- w- this week on 1 20th. <laughs> or to be short about it. Twi- Have you ever heard of Democracy Now? I haven't, but I'm going to check it out. It looks good. Uh, Daniel, can you take the next one? Sure. Jason writes in TWIP episode 114 at about 720, <laughs> you stated that in response to the dual needs of diagnostics and containment, Ebola treatment units had been built with PCR machines in them. To the best of my knowledge, this is not the case. I worked for six months in Liberia mm. during the Ebola crisis and have many close colleagues who worked in Sierra Leone. I'm not personally aware of a single ETU that had its own PCR capabilities. It is possible that the ETU run by the Chinese government may have had this capacity, but I don't believe so. During the Ebola crisis, PCR samples were transported by Land Rovers, often significant distances over muddy roads. We had an elaborate protocol for labeling and decontaminating the transportation vessel. Toward the end of the crisis, the logistics of this became even more complicated as many of the testing centers closed due to reduced demand and transport distances became even further. The only diagnostic Mm. capability that we had in the ETUs was a point of care malaria test, though this was largely pointless as the Hastings protocol calls for treatment with Caratam regardless. So I made that comment because on TWIV 341, which is this week in virology, it's another podcast. One one one-fortieth of a point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Number 341 was an episode called Ebola Virus Experience. I had interviewed a, a student named Jillian Slack who said she worked in an Ebola treatment center doing PCR. And if you go back and listen, you can uh-huh. hear her saying that now. She may have meant that the PCR thing was next to the ETC. Uh, I don't know. But she said, I worked in a bowl of the treatment right. center. I said, what did you do there? She said, I did PCR. So that's what mine is based on. But you were there, so you must know. So maybe you can figure out what she meant. <clears throat> okay. Last email. What's the matter, Dixon? Nothing. Anthony writes, when I was a child in the days of Silent Spring, 
insects were very visible. At night, there'd be galaxies of moths and gnats surrounding every street light. <laughs> the same would be true in a lesser way for bulbs illuminating a porch. This is no longer so. The number of night-flying insects has been much less, and this year, dramatically so. I keep a vestibule door open during the day to prevent heat buildup in that small space. It had been important to close the door at night or many moths, gnats, and crane flies attracted to the light would need to be chased out in the morning. This year, nocturnal insect visitors have been very few. That the insect vanishing point is not just a quirk of my street seems to be confirmed by the observations of a cross-country trucker who found his way to Jersey City Free Books. He related how his father had had the same occupation. Back in the 70s, the then young son's chore on his father's return was to hose off the truck grill. Right. From impact with the swarms of flying insects, there'd be a thick buildup there. The trucker right. went on to say how when he gets back west, now there'll be just a few dead bugs here and there. The curious thing is that the mosquitoes seem to be doing very well. Indeed, the buckets of water that result from my cleaning fish tank filters need to be quickly dumped or hordes of mosquito larvae will result. Here, here. Hmm. Mm. Well, I don't know. I drove through Pennsylvania a couple of months ago and I had tons of mis of bugs of all kinds. Depends on the place. season. <laughs> and, and when I went through over, over streams, particularly, I guess it, it depends. Maybe in Jersey City, <clears throat> there are not many bugs. Right. Have you noticed this trend, less bugs, Dixon? Um... You're a you're country in the, man. In the east, <laughs> no, no, I'm not kidding. I think I think the observation is correct because most of the hatches in the rivers have been reduced in amounts. This why, may why be, is that? It, well, we have many hypotheses for this, of course. And, you know, the closer the farmland gets to the river and the more insecticides they use to keep down the insect uh -huh. pests on the farms, it runs off and gets into the rivers and that doesn't. But also just encroachment into wetlands and just mm -hmm. to fill those in and to put up structures that keeps down the number of insects. Why are also. the mosquitoes okay though? Ah, because those are Culex pipians mostly, and they breed in polluted water, very domestically. And it didn't say which uh -huh. mosquitoes, of course. So you know you have to look at that. And the other thing I'm confused about is that we've got white nose syndrome as a fungus infection in bats, which eat those insects. Those bats are disappearing, so those insects should be increasing. Yeah, but those bats aren't in Hoboken or Jersey City. No, but I've seen outbreaks also of. of um, Hmm. Of forest moths and of, um, <clears throat> I'm blocking on the name, of course, because it's so common that I've forgotten it. Come on, you know the name of the um, what? the outbreak of, um, they, they wanted to use it as a substitute for silk production in the United States, so they imported the gypsy moth. Mm -hmm. And the gypsy mm -hmm. moth outbreak uh, this year was significant. We had a lot of gypsy moths. Really? I didn't see any. Uh, Pennsylvania had a huge outbreak. We were supposed to have a cicada Hatching, but I didn't see any. I hear them, but I don't see any of them on the on Right, the right. I, so you're, you live in the country, Daniel. Do you see fewer bugs? I, I do, actually. I mean, as as I was I was listening to this email, it, it rings true. I mean, what uh, my uh, memories um, from growing up, and actually not very far, about 15 <laughs> miles from where I currently live, yeah. is just, I remember that. The porch lights at night, just That's the right. swarms of uh, well, insects. Lightning bugs. You know, yeah, I mean, we still see lightning bugs. Not, not like we but used to. But not like we used to. No, I mean, it's true. I that agree. was, you know, now it's more of a treat. When I was a kid, it was yeah, it was every true. night we would just... However, there were some remarkable incidents this year which deserve reporting, and that is that you know, around the Great Lakes, there is a large mayfly that hatches in the late summer, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. middle of July, actually, and it's called the hexagenia hatch. The wing, the wing measures about two and a half inches tall. Mm. Then they hatch in profusion, and usually at night. And some of the bridges that go across the inlets to these large lakes get so inundated with these mayflies hatching that it's a hazard to drive on them. It's like slippery snow. And cars have actually crashed into the barriers and gone off into the lake as mm. a result of that. And there were incidents of that this year. So in some cases, depends on the timing, depends on where you are. Uh, if you drive out west, of course, along rivers, you're certain to pick up caddises on your windshield yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. So like you were saying, yeah. coming back from Pennsylvania. Well, maybe some listeners could send in their experiences with bugs. Yeah, but I think deforestation and, and... Yeah, it makes sense. It's a good urbanization, idea. Urbanization. All right. That's what's doing well, it. Well, thank you for those emails. Uh, you can find TWIP at iTunes and at microbe.tv slash TWIP. Think about becoming a patron of TWIP as well as the other shows of microbe tv you can contribute as little as a buck a month at patreon.com slash microbe tv 
or go to microbe.tv slash contribute for other options. And you don't have to uh, support us. That's fine. But if you do anything, do one thing. Go over to iTunes, even if you don't listen in iTunes, and just rate the show. That helps it stay visible over on iTunes. And that's how a lot of people discover podcasts. So that would be great as well. Please send your questions and comments to twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is right here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. A pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and verticalfarm.com. Thank Indeed. you, Dixon. Had a great time. And when he's not there, he's in the lakes getting amoeba. <laughs> River, rivers, 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 rivers please. <laughs> getting the trout, not the, not the amoeba. <laughs> there are no amoeba in the, in the rivers, right? If it's cold, no. That's right. But you only go to cold places, right? I try to just do that. Now, over in Pennsylvania, that place you go to, is that cold also? Oh, yeah, that's right. Why is it so cold and it's been hot out? I don't well, get it. Well, this is in the mountains, first of all, and there's a lot of springs that come out of the mountains that take cold water and put it into the water. <laughs> Maybe someday you could teach me about springs and rivers. I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.